Now, our next presentation is focused more around the theme of disruption. Many of you may be familiar with David McWilliams, who is an independent economist. Sean Anderson, the head of sales for Netgroup Investments, speaks to him about his global macroeconomic outlook. Sean, over to you. Good morning, David, and welcome to the Negroup Investments Global Investment Summit. Thank you for joining us today. And where in the world do we find you? I'm uh, down here in the basement, Sean. If you can see now, this is my man shed. And I've been here on my Todd for about two years, okay? Talking to myself. And sometimes the dog comes down. That's about the height of it. But we have like a beer fridge over there. We have weights over here that haven't been lifted for about 20 months. So I'm like every man. I'm down here. We're kind of opened up in Ireland. We're kind of fully vaxxed. We're about 90% vaxxed, but everyone's still a little bit sheepish about going out. So, for example, we had to cancel our Kilconomics Festival, which is on in November, because we just can't be sure that people want to go out. So, as you said, Sean, it's funny, funny, funny times. Funny, strange, strange couple of years. And hopefully, Sean, I'll be back down in SA 2022. And talking about next year, I guess that is the, the idea of today's presentation. And really, to sum up, I think 2021 uh, thus far, it really has been a disruptive one. And that really is the topic of our talk, which is that of disruption, which I think uh, really sums it up well. So on that note, maybe to hand over to you about some of the disruptive forces that you're currently seeing and, and also the impact, of course, that it has for years to come. On the issue of disruption, Sean, I have been reading. The great thing about the lockdown is... It's allowed me to go and read all sorts of mad stuff. And I'm reading about Indian monetary history, okay, in India. And I want to tell you a story about disruption, which should give us a little bit of cause for, well, let's say just a, it's a little, it's a cautionary tale. It's a cautionary tale, right? In 1857, there was what the British call the Delhi Mutiny in India. Now, it wasn't a mutiny at all. It was actually a rebellion because the soldiers that mutineered were actually Indian soldiers that wanted to get rid of British occupation. But the Brits had to tell in terms of the story themselves, so they called it a mutiny. So it was as if some bunch of ungrateful Indians had turned their noses up at the munificence of British colonial rule. Now, of course, the Brits wanted to keep India, Sean, because India was the jewel in the crown. I'll give you a statistic, okay? When the British arrived in India, India constituted 31% of global GDP. Think about that, 31%. It was the biggest country economy in the world for the previous 2000 years, even bigger than China, right? When the British left in 1948, India was 3% of global GDP. So they managed to loot 27% of global GDP out of India over a period of about 150, 200 years. In fact, the word loot, Sean, is an Indian word. It's the, one of the very few Indian words that's found its way into the English language. So very, very clearly, the British, after this mutiny, after this rebellion in, in, in 1857, they were thinking, hold on a second, we want to keep this place. So what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And they did what they did in many of their colonies. They decided to kill the national movement with kindness, right? So they decided to invest in public works, all sorts of things like railways and what have you, right? It's not to say the Indians wouldn't have had railways had the Brits not been there. In fact, it's very clear that they would have had, given how wealthy they were. But anyway, so they start to send out these people all around India, uh, reporting back to London, trying to improve the lot of the average Indian so that you'd actually take the wind out of the sails of the nationalist movement so that Britain could continue using India as an extraordinary colony and taking all the cash out of there. And one of the things just after the 1857 mutiny was there was an infestation of cobras in Delhi, right? Now, if you've ever been to Old Delhi, I don't know if people have, Old Delhi is the most phenomenal place, right? It's the Mughal Empire's center of commerce of Delhi. It's fetid, it's smelly, it's full. You don't do social distancing there, let's just say that, right? It's just, it is an abyss of a sea of humanity. Now, you can imagine back in the day what it was like, okay? And of course, you get an outbreak of cobras. So the British decide, okay, we're going to ingratiate ourselves to the local Indians by stamping out this outbreak of cobras because kids were getting poisoned and killed by the cobras, right? 
And of course, the Brits realised that India was full of snake charmers and snake catchers or whatever. So back in London, the economists who were running the show sat down and they said, as economists, what will we do? And they said, what we should do is we should give a reward for the cobras. So therefore, the cobra killers will go out and they'll actually get the reward. And over time, they'll kill all the cobras and Bob's your uncle, we will have solved the problem. So they give the award, and I think it was about 50 pence in old money, right? And the cobra killers in India reacted in exactly the way you might think they did. And very, very soon, what you said was a complete collapse in the cobra population in New Delhi. And the guys in London said, all right, that's it, problem solved. It all works, etc. And then about two or three months later, they start to see something very strange, which is a huge increase in the cobra population. And this is reported back to London, and the Brits in London can't understand what the hell is happening there. We thought we'd eradicate this problem. But what they've done, Sean, and this is the key for economic policy, right? That sometimes your best intentions go bad. What they had done was the following. They didn't realise that what the Indians figured out was, if we're going to get 50 pence for every cobra, we shouldn't kill them, we should breed them. Right? So the Indians turned the logic completely on its head. They bred cobras. Suddenly the place was infested with cobras. The Indians were there killing a certain amount of them, going to get their reward. But what the Indians did was they maintained the cobra production or population much higher. Right? Now what this means, Sean, for our discussion, is the best intentions in the world in a time of disruption can go really badly wrong. You think you're doing the right thing, you're pull, pulling that policy lever, or as an investor, you're seeing something clearly, you're moving towards a stock or a bond or an asset. And because the world is so complex, Sean, and because the world is like a large living organism where you can't predict at all what the next person's going to do. So the Indian cobra hunters became cobra breeders. The Brits in London couldn't understand that. We have to be very careful about what's happening because we are now in a most disruptive age. And disruptive ages, Sean, are usually defined by a change in technology and a change in social behavior. Once those two come together, you get disruptive change. A change in technology on its own, Sean, isn't enough. A change in social attitudes on their own isn't enough. You have to have this sweet spot where they both come together. And the thing with the pandemic has done, as we know, is it's changed the way we live. So when you think now, Sean, of what's going on in the world, right? What's going on? What we have is an extremely strong recovery from a bizarre event, okay? I give you a statistic. The peak to trough recovery in GDP, global GDP, has been the most dramatic in 300 years, okay? 300 years, we've never seen a fall in GDP like this or a rise. Now, what has that done? It means that what we've got, we've been hit two ways, Sean. We've been hit by a demand shock because people were told to stay at home and a supply shock because people were told to stay at home. Okay. One of those things that happens after that is when you allow demand come back in, all those pent up savings that people had with the state was paying people money, etc., etc., etc. They're sitting in bank accounts, just ready to be spent. I don't know if you've been watching Europe over the course of the summer, but the tourist numbers, the restaurant spends, the nightclubs, all that going through the roof, demand in the economy, Sean, reacts really quickly, right? Because it's, it's basically from your back pocket to the retailer. Supply does not. And that has led to this, what we call the lumpiness of inflation data, okay? So the first thing we should talk about is the inflation data. The second thing then is to give us a bit more long-term, we've got two long-term ideas, one short-term idea. The first long-term idea, Sean, is to look at what happened after the last huge global pandemic that really impacted on the world, which was the Spanish flu, which wasn't Spanish at all, it actually came from America, but the Spanish have a branding problem. The American marketing department was working overtime to outsource culpability to somebody else, right? What happened in the 1920s was an extraordinary effervescence after an extraordinary period of disruption. So in the 1920s, think about all the areas. In literature, you get Joyce. In art, you get Picasso. We're talking the period of Freud and psychoanalysts. We're talking the, when Einstein is at his most powerful, right? So you've, in all the big areas, you get this huge cultural change, massive cultural change. 
In economics, what do you get in the 1920s, particularly in the United States? You get electricity, you get elevators, you get radios, you get airplanes, and of course, the big one is you get motor cars, right? All of these were technologies that were being massaged during the First World War into the pandemic, and then they were commercialized in the 1920s. A lot of people, and I think there's a lot of good reasons to say, would suggest that we're going to see something quite similar on the technological front, on the scientific front, and health and all those things over the course of the next couple of years. So what you have then is how do we disentangle one inflation story, which is slightly negative for world growth, okay, but another much more interesting philosophical story, which is much more positive for the global economy. And think about the United States in the 20s. This was the roaring 20s. The question is, are we going to go back there? And that's what we should discuss now, whether or not we're in the beginning of a process which is going to see a significant boom in economic growth. Thank you, Dave. And on, the, on, that, on that note uh, around policy, when are we going to see inflation coming back? We obviously have very different schools of thought. How do you see it playing out in the years to come? Yeah, really, really good question, Sean. I mean, what I think is going on at the moment is we are coming out of the most bizarre, bizarre economic period. We have an economic experiment going on, which is spending a huge amount of money we don't really have in order to keep demand at a certain level. But it's not surprising that you would get inflation in certain areas when the supply response, I mean, I'm even looking at it, you know, all, even around here, Ireland, Britain, there's labor shortages, there's supply shortages, there's all sorts of difficulties coming from the fact that we've been shut down for so long. So what I think is happening is that there's a massive difference between aggregate inflation and incidence of inflation in certain markets. So I'm actually going along with the central banking view that this is a transitory thing. I think that we can't look at the economy now as it was in 2018, 2019. We have to appreciate that lots and lots of businesses have been broken. Lots and lots of supply chains have been broken. Lots and lots of shortages in certain markets are going to be evident for some time until the whole thing balances out because the economy is a complex thing. It's not something that just can be fixed overnight. So my own view is that A, this is transitory. Now, regarding the inflationistas, what you find is something very, very interesting in the data, Sean, is that if you look at consumer surveys of do you worry about inflation, do you not, etc., all over the Western world, older people are very worried about inflation. Younger people don't care. Now, why is that? I think it's because we are the sum of our own personal experiences as human beings, right? Now, older people live through the 1970s. They remember a time when inflation took off. They also remember a time when inflation was prolonged. It was going on for a long time. So they are much more likely, and you see, you will see this in investor surveys as well. Older investors are much more worried about inflation than younger investors. So younger investors and younger players in the market are saying, inflation, what the hell is that? I'm actually concerned about inequality or global warming or something like that. That's what I'm concerned about. I'm not concerned about inflation. Older folk have collective memories. Now, if you also look at the inflationistas in the economics profession, they're all the older economists. They're all economists who were trained in the 70s, who remember what it was like, who came of age in the 80s, when the entire economic, how would you say, direction was anti-inflation, disinflation, let's crush inflation. So those guys are now in their 60s or maybe into their 70s. They're really at the top of the game because the thing about economics is, you know, it only progresses one funeral at a time. So basically what you're going to get is at the end, you have this huge, big, bunch of older economists, they're very worried about inflation. I actually think it's something to do with age and experience. That's the first thing. Second thing is I therefore think the central banks are right. Third thing is if it is about supply bottlenecks, raising interest rates will not help you, right? This is the most important thing because if it is about, you know, the fact that shipping has been screwed by the Suez Canal, right? Or the fact that lumber is in short supply, right? Raising interest rates ain't going to help that. Raising interest rates is going to just simply choke off what is a recovery, but would still kind of fitful because we don't really know where we're going. The other thing is history is always 
a good helper in this regard, right? If you think about what happened after the Second World War, and you contrast what happened after the First World War. After the Second World War, because let's say, for example, countries like America and Britain and the whole of Europe was still rationing, there were supply bottlenecks, the economy was screwed, industrial production, industrial manufacturing had been destroyed by bombing, right? There were loads of spikes of inflation in the late 40s and early 50s, right? But no central banker had the appetite to raise interest rates because that would have been raising interest rates on the soldiers who were coming back from the front. And what we got in the 1950s, therefore, was a recovery that gradually began to gain pace. And in the 1950s, we got growth rates all around the Western world, phenomenal growth rates, extraordinary uh, company formation, and basically a golden era, right? So you take, that's the 50s in general. The 20s is different because on the one hand, you have technological progress, which was very good in the United States. But in Europe, what we did was we tightened too quickly. We wanted to go back to the gold standard too quickly. And what actually happened in Europe is we tightened so quickly in the early 20s. This led to massive dislocation, massive disruption. And by the late 1920s, we had fascist movements all over the continent. Okay, so you've got to be very, very careful what's going on. I think the central bankers at Jackson Hole, I was just listening to them last week and listening to the communique, you know, and, and Jay Powell's you know, pretty cautious stuff. I think they realize that we're basically in a transition period and we've got to wait. I think the inflationistas are wrong on this, but I think longer term, longer term over the next decade, there could be more inflation in the system. And that's simply because we're going to change the way we did the kind of neoliberal experiment between 19, let's say 1980 and 2020 is over. And we will have to gradually reduce inequalities. We will have to gradually stem the, the growth of the financial sector, et cetera, et cetera. These are, these are just politics. So there's a lot going on, Sean, but I would say short term, don't worry about inflation. Short term, don't worry about a massive hike in rates. Short term, don't therefore worry about a massive increase in, in the dollar and dollar exchanges, because I don't think it's going to happen. Thank you, Dave. And I think one thing, however, we do worry about is globalization. I think you'll agree that a lot of it, a lot of the good work done around globalization has been eroded with COVID. Um, and, and particularly as it yes. goes to supply chains, which you mentioned, but also the US-China uh, relationship. Just some thoughts on that and w where you see that relationship going from here. This is, this is a fantastic question, Sean. This is, this is the most interesting thing that's going on at the moment, okay? This is the, have you ever heard of an actress called Vicky Chow? Okay, have you ever heard of her? Sean, maybe no. not, right? Maybe you don't follow Chinese popular culture, right? This is an actress. This is like a combination of Katy Perry, Nicki Minaj, and Liz Taylor together, okay? She is the queen of Chinese popular culture. She has just been cancelled, disappeared off the face of the earth. Nobody knows where she is. What is going on in China right now is phenomenal. There's a new culture war going on in China, almost like a cultural revolution. And the party is going after celebrities. It's an amazing thing that's what, what's happening there, right? And I'm, I'm using this as a launch pad to discuss everything else, right? Right now in China, boy bands, celebrities, afternoon TV presenters, chat show hosts, pop stars are all being cancelled. They're all being called sissy boys, right, by the official media. And when you're cancelled in China, you disappear. There is a huge cultural revolution going on in China and Xi is orchestrating the whole thing from the top to basically say, you know that Gilded Age we went through with huge inequality and pop culture and celebrity culture, that's over. And we're going to go right back to a sort of a Maoism with capitalist overtones, right? It's really extraordinary. So do you remember when Jack Ma disappeared this time last year? People were like, well, this is really odd. And what's going on? This was the beginning of a process of strangulation. The party is strangling the freedom of expression in China. Because what basically happened, if you look at what happened in China over the last 40 years, it can be really defined by an expression that Deng Xiaoping said in 1988. Because in 1988, the Chinese began to open up, maybe 1985, right? And Deng Xiaoping was asked, what's going to happen to socialism? What's going to happen to the party? 
And he said very, very cryptically, he said, I don't care whether the cat is black or white, as long as that cat catches mice. Now, what he meant by that, okay, is he was also touching on Chinese philosophy and Chinese history, but what he actually meant is, I don't care if we end up capitalist, socialist, or communist, whether we're black or white, I don't care, as long as the mouse catches mice, as long as the economy we create enriches people, gets us out of poverty, and puts us on the road to what the Chinese feel is they are, they call themselves the middle kingdom, the middle of the world, the road to be back where they should be. I mean, remember the Chinese regarded the last hundred years, they call it the century of humiliation, right? Between 1850 and 1950. So there's lots going on, but what they're doing now is fascinating. Now just follow, you should, you should follow Chinese blogs, right? There was a Chinese blog released about four weeks ago by a really kind of unknown blogger, okay? And it was called The New Revolution. And of course, he was unknown, but it was entirely supported by the party. So every platform have it, every outlet have it. And if you read the translation in English, it's phenomenal. It's, a, it's attacking celebrities, it's attacking liberal culture, it's attacking Americanism, it's attacking the West. It's, it's, it's totally changed. So this goes to the heart of the US-Chinese relationship. So the question is, why now? Why did they change now? Why are they locking up pop stars now? Why are they saying that K-pop is imported from Korea and is contaminating the Chinese soul? And it is related to Joe Biden because the Chinese believed in their hearts of hearts that Joe Biden would be a typical democratic president. And democratic presidents tend to be multilateral in their instinct, right? And they thought he'd be much more like Obama and he would be much more pro-Chinese. And of course, the acid test to pro or anti-Chinese is Taiwan. Where do you stand on Taiwan? Because Taiwan is the Berlin. Do you remember during the Berlin Wall, the Berlin airlift? Taiwan is the Berlin of American-Chinese relations. And Biden has said very, very clearly, we are on the Taiwanese side. Now that is completely at odds with Xi, because Xi has also said that Taiwan is China and we will get it back sooner rather than later. So what we're seeing is this extraordinary ratcheting up of nationalism in China. And this is, of course, all a reaction to Huawei and all that stuff. Why did we think that you could try and disembowel Chinese technology and they wouldn't react? I mean, this is the bizarre thing. So I think we're going into a very, very hot situation over there where frankly sean supply chains are the least of our worries but i'll give you one last thing on supply chains in march of 2019 no march of 2020 sorry when the pandemic hit i remember watching tv here and seeing a procession of leaders of big western countries the united states germany britain france these big countries queuing up begging the Chinese to give us PPE equipment. I don't know if you remember that, that we didn't have any equipment. And I'd imagine if you're sitting there and you're an advisor to Merkel or whoever, to Biden, or you know, Biden wasn't there then, or, or, or Johnson or whatever, you're kind of saying, okay, you see that thing of chi queuing up and begging the Chinese for equipment? That ain't never going to happen again. We will never, ever be as dependent on supply chains, which are so distant that we don't know who we're dealing with again. So I think supply chains will control will contract quite dramatically. I think there'll be a lot of onshoring of manufacturing. I think we're going to see a huge shift and all that is spooking the Chinese so much so that they're now going after their own people. I mean, this is like the Cultural Revolution, except it's done at a time where everybody has one of these, a smartphone. So you can see what's going on. In the Cultural Revolution, you couldn't see what was going on. So I think that's one to watch, Sean. It's a big, big change. Biggest change in the last 40 years, I think, because the last 40 years have been defined as China emerging, China being a disinflationary force, China being a benign manufacturing partner, China being a very, very good global citizen, yada, yada, yada. That's all over. And we're into a different period. And the reason they've attacked big tech is because big tech is seen as the source of income and wealth inequality in China. After all, we forget, Sean, that this is a communist country. You know, that, that the, these people believe in 
equality. They believe in upward social mobility for the many, not the few, and they believe in the collective over the individual. So what they're attacking, like celebrity and superstars and pop stars, are all about individuals doing extremely well. So I think what we will see, and I mean, I don't know if you read George Soros's piece in the FT last week, where Soros is saying, look, investing in China is now foolhardy in the extreme uh, because they have no intention, no intention of ever letting any Westerner make, you know, I think it was, was it Soros said, I think it was actually Michael Milken said, you can make anything in China except money. And I thought it was a really good expression, right? And what's happening now is the Chinese are going back to their chosen path, which is still genuflecting to Mao, still genuflecting to Marx. And what they realize is they can do it. You can have a world beating economy without democracy, without liberal capitalism, without an open press, etc. You can do it because they've already done it. And of course, being on your side of the world, we need to always cover the topic, which is that of Brexit. Um, some views there of how that's playing out and as boring it is, as it is to often talk about it, uh, anything that you see as, as further being disruptive in the years to come? Well, I mean, the big, the big problem with Brexit in this, in this benighted part of the world is that it, igni it ignites nationalism. Right? So Brexit is an English nationalist project. And what you always find in confederations like the United Kingdom, for example, which you know, is still a federation of three different races, maybe three and a half different races, okay? Is that if the big race becomes nationalistic, it freaks out the smaller guys. So the only way the confederation can stay as a united force is if England continues to subjugate its own sense of nationalism. Now, the problem with Brexit is it's an English project, anti-European and it left the Scots with very little option. So as we go forward in this part of the world, the big thing is the constitutional issue of what happens to Scotland. At the moment, the polls are narrowing. The Nats were right out in front for a while. The polls are now narrowed back. It's very, very hard to tell. But once you ignite English nationalism, you scare all the other nationalities, which are basically on the fringes of power. And that's the big problem. As for what's happening in the UK itself, you know, I think the UK economy is still very lopsided. The problem with the UK economy is you take London out, there's nothing there, right? And it's very, very different. We spoke about China, you know, we talked about Korea and Japan. You know, these are countries whose manufacturing is so far ahead of everybody now, okay? Even Germany is so far ahead. And the reason it's so far ahead is they've been investing, investing for many years. You can't reimagine a manufacturing sector. My sense is that Britain is just too far behind now to catch up in manufacturing. So what they had was a huge gamble on financial services. As we know, the business we're in, right? The problem with a gamble in financial services is it demands that you're open to your neighbors, right? It demands that money and technology and people can flow freely between London and Paris, London and Berlin, etc. Once that becomes questionable or questioned, what it means is in effect, you're actually taking that golden goose that threw off all this money for many, many years, increased tax revenue in the UK and allowed money go from London up to the north and Scotland, and uh, a place like that. Now that's kind of, well, the government has decided that's over. The question is what is going to replace that? Because every country needs a trick. Sean, this is what I always say, right? It doesn't matter what your trick is, you need something special. And the Brits had something special. They had finance, and they had advertising, they had marketing, it's all based in London, and it gave them the tax revenue they needed to keep the, the regions quiet. If you turn your back on that, which is explicitly what Johnson has done, then I think, I, I'm, I'm not sure where they find another one. So there's a constitutional and an economic issue in the UK that I'm not sure which way it's gonna pan out, but it's certainly a lot less stable than it was four years ago. I'm very optimistic that the 2020s will be fantastic for technology and fantastic for people who can avail of it. But the question is, how are we going to get enough 
blue collar jobs to enough people to make sure that social peace is maintained. Because people like you and I, and maybe many people on this call, are going to benefit enormously from the collapse in the price of technology, from changes in healthcare, all that sort of thing. But how do we get, and in South Africa, you really have this problem, and it's severe. How do we get enough jobs, enough income, enough aspirations to enough people so they don't feel left behind? And, and, and that, I think, is the big political story, and which is why Joe Biden is doing what he's doing. Think about what Joe Biden's doing, right? Joe Biden is printing money, never before tried in the United States, or giving out money for free over there. And Biden, in effect, has been mugged by Bernie Sanders on the left and by Donald Trump, or the ghost of Donald Trump on the right. So the ghost of Donald Trump is pulling out of Afghanistan. That was the Trumpian policy. We, we get out, we get out of the world, we get back, we go home, we fix things. The Bernie idea is you've got to fix infrastructure, you've got to fix the working man, you've got to talk to the blue collar, you've got to be in Pittsburgh, not Philadelphia, that sort of idea. America can do this because it has the resources. Europe can do it because it has the resources. The question is, do emerging markets, which is, you know, where the growth in the world is coming, I mean, do you guys appreciate that in 2080, 2080, it's not that far away, right? That four people in every 10 in the world will be African. Four people in every 10, right? That the continent of Africa, which is so phenomenally huge, okay, is the future of demography in the world because China's population will have started to, well, very soon will have started to fall. India's population as well. Turkey's population, Iran, all these big, big countries, Indonesia, Brazil, but Africa, the population rises. And we know that demography is destiny. So there's so many huge things going on, Sean. But I would say in the very near term, this 2020s could be a fascinating place, but the world is going to look so different in a couple of years' time, even from the world now. And that's probably not a bad thing. Thank you, Sean and David.